to one of our Becoming Baby Friendly in Oklahoma webinars, and um, this is actually kind of an extra one we're doing, not um, particular to any of the uh, three groups that we have um, working towards baby friendly. We've in, in actually included all of the hospitals, and this was a webinar we did uh, last year with Dr. Madam in England, and we had a lot of requests to repeat, so here we are, and um, I will, um, can't talk and make notes at the same time, so stop that. Um, <laughs> so um, let me just introduce um, Dr. Madam Anglin, who is our speaker today. He is uh, the Chief um, Director of uh, OB Anesthesia at the OU Health Sciences Center, so obviously works um, very closely with the OBGYNs, midwives, labor nurses, and so forth, and has done a lot to um, <clears throat> Help, uh, help us implement skin-to-skin uh, -skin, um, in the OR, or ASAP after cesareans um, at OU Medical Center. So I will um, actually, let me see Dr. Madam Anglin, if I can uh, turn this over to you. And let's see if that's going to... Let's see if I give it. Is that giving? See if you can move the mouse yet. Not really, no. No. But, um, okay, let's see. Oh, it's okay. We, we can just keep moving. I mean, you can help me move this slide. Right. Really, possibly it's not such a. Okay, that's big issue. okay. But but anyway, we'll. I guess we can. Um, if you're ready, I can. Yeah, yeah. You, go ahead. Anything else that you want to say? Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. to introduce yourself. Oh, nothing. Good. Um, just want to say good morning to everybody, good morning. and thank you uh, to everybody for having taken a little bit of time off your, I'm sure, busy days to come listen in. Um, and I'm very, very privileged, I think, to be able to uh, be involved with uh, a group of people that so care about um, mothers and babies, and we need to do the best we can to do. Um, do the best we can for our mothers and our babies because truly they are our the few they are our future. I mean, not not using it in a cliched fashion, but honestly, it is true. Um, and we should do everything possible, and I'm glad we are working towards it um, in every little bit, and every little bit counts. And I I've been here at the University of Oklahoma for a goodish number of years, I have to say, and I and the last time I did this talk, and I learned a lot about uh, the skin-to-skin -skin process and and I thank Becky for involving me. It, it just opens an, a whole other facet that we don't really pay a whole lot of attention to and I and hopefully we are going to continue to improve and increase this. Um, and I'll also tell you on the next screen there's a short um, a disclaimer that I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, all the only conflict I do have is I'm quite interested in making sure that we can provide uh, for skin to skin um, ability or experience for all mothers that want to do it if they if they really want to and on the next screen there's a little bit of a background about how um, skin to skin is not an uncommon phenomenon if we stop to think about it and we think about uh, pictures of mothers and babies no matter in which, not necessarily in humans, but in, in the mammalian world, you see they're very, very close to each other, reasonably so well, very soon after birth, they're snuggle against each other. The baby and the mother are basically looking at each other, and, and we see that um, with, with this proximity, we see there's um, the baby exhibits behavior such as rooting and um, hand-to-mouth movements or um, suckling, sucking movements, so you, you know there's some inbuilt hardwired phenomenon in the mother and the baby, and this is certainly a very sensitive time that promotes a certain, uh, a certain amount of reciprocity, um, and it, I don't know whether we need huge studies to kind of prove this, and I think there are, obviously there are some, that that, that, that proximity, that, that closeness, is, and that intimate contact is a useful thing especially in the animal world it's a big survival thing where that bonding and that proximity and that breastfeeding uh, is promoted by this and, and a little bit of science um, 
as there's a fair amount of science out there that um, it promotes on the next screen you'll see perhaps um, is that it promotes um, oxytocin Oops. release and this oxytocin release is so important it's one of those hormones that is, is an important part of pregnancy and birthing and we, we know that especially for birthing and then its importance is being recognized as being um, something that helps with um, bonding or the material or a, a, a promoting the maternal instinct um, not only does it do that this oxytocin release we all know very well indeed that helps with uh, you know let down of the milk breastfeeding and that's another prime need for the newborn and so everything we do to promote that in the human uh, situation um, is possibly going to promote the health of the baby and that's, I think we all understand and agree that we play a very significant role in the whole prospect of have, you know having healthy babies and, and healthy mothers around. So oxytocin release um, is, is caused by the touch and the warmth and the smell um, for the mother um, of the baby and this and it also raises maternal temperature and obviously when the mother and, and the baby are clo in close proximity it helps keeping the baby warm. Um, in addition to it, uh, oxytocin also is an, sort of an anti-stress hormone. It reduces maternal stress. It has a calming effect. It improves and that closeness possibly, closeness possibly improves uh, the sense of security that, that's in, uh, in the baby as well as the mother um, and I would think there is a certain amount of anxiety involved with the separation of the baby and the mother um, even if it, in the normal circumstances and I'm sure you would, you would have all noticed that uh, the mother is really anxious to hold the baby and have the baby close by and skin to skin contact actually promotes this and kind of um, satisfies that perhaps um, craving of the mother to have that baby as close as possible. Um, and um, we also know, like I mentioned before, oxytocin does help with bonding and it promotes parenting behaviors. Um, so we, so if you look at it in a way on the next screen, you'll see it's a, this, this skin to skin or this snuggling phenomenon is a natural phenomenon. It adds and helps with thermoregulation. It promotes lactation. It causes a calming sense in the infant. Um, it might promote breast, early breastfeeding. And from the maternal perspective, it gives a mother an immense sense of satisfaction to hold that baby that she's um, been anticipating to see. It enhances um, her self-esteem. Um, and it's also been noted that there's better neurobehavioral development in the child. Um, so. Um, uh, well, from our perspective, from the lactation perspective, it possibly helps initiate breastfeeding. If I'm onto the next slide, and then it helps you see that it initiates uh, birth breastfeeding or attempts at birth at, at birth breastfeeding, or you know um, behaviors that promote breastfeeding early. Not only does it help with milk let down, it also um, promotes those behaviors which are good for the baby um, and and to promote it is, is I think, our responsibility. The idea um, is that it also encourages bonding. Uh, the mothers can sh will, should be able to hold the baby as soon as possible, especially in vaginal birth, because uh, the mother should be relatively free. Um, and then the idea is to continue, con continue consistent and constant skin contact, skin-to-skin -skin contact, for at least the first hour of life. Um, that may not be possible, obviously, uh, in surgical situations under general anesthesia, in which, at which time uh, we probably can use a sort of a maternal surrogate, which is a family member who we're, we're going to maybe the husband or the support person if they're willing and capable and subscribe to subscribe to, to this idea of doing skin-to-skin -skin contact. They can bring the baby. They can hold the baby. Obviously, when the mother's recovered under general anesthesia, and we, it's considered safe that she's awake enough and strong enough to hold the baby. She can take on the responsibility of holding the baby. Uh, the whole idea is, um, next, next, on the next screen, the, the, it's that we should get healthy mothers and healthy babies to be skin to skin during the 
uh, in, and in, in, during the first hour of life. If not the mother, then the father can hold it as that picture shows. That picture is um, I, it's from some Middle Eastern country, and I can't really tell you which one because I don't remember anymore. But there, there's a whole set of mothers, fathers carrying their babies, skin to skin. I thought that was cute. Uh, <laughs> a baby, obviously, we don't need to interrupt that skin to skin contact unless there's a surgical medical procedure that needs to be done. Uh, this is a time for them to quietly bond the baby to get acclimatized to the rest of the world that the baby's been suddenly exposed to, experience the warmth, the smell, the contact, and um, everything else that the baby possibly accrues when the baby's in close contact. But this contact doesn't mean that we need to try and apply the baby to the breast. It probably will generate some behaviors in the baby that the, like a sucking, sucking reflex or um, hand-to-mouth movements, but if that happens, that's fine. There's no need to promote this as a factor that will um, yeah, sorry, enhance can't. early breastfeeding. It might uh, help with the breastfeeding process. This is just an uninterrupted time, and obviously, this is apply, this is applicable to either in the inter uh, in the intraoperative air time period or the uh, you know, LDR or the birthing room situation. Um, in the next screen, I write a little bit about what we tend to do and how we tend to do it. Uh, we have, if it's a vaginal birth, we try and get that baby a hat and a diaper as soon as possible, which is very quickly after. We basically have the baby delivered and place it on the mother's belly, dry the baby off, put a cap and diaper on. And then once the baby is separated from the placenta, we put the baby uh, with the arms bent, the legs frog leg between the breasts vertically or in, in a slightly crosswise fashion, just to make, just making sure the baby's mouth and nose are not buried in the mother's chest. Um, there's definite skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, we put warm blankets on the baby and the mother. The mother in the vaginal birth is fairly warmed up with all the pushing that she's done. So trying to warm the mother is not such a big issue as opposed to when the mother's in, in the OR. Um, and the mother will, will automatically cradle the baby in her arms, but no, ma no matter how well she's holding it, there should be somebody that's paying attention to the fact that she is holding the baby securely. And I just mentioned it just to complete the list, and I don't know whether we, we even need to emphasize that. Um, obviously, there should be no blanket between the mother and the baby. So when we do a cesarean section is when it's a little bit variable. What we do in this, on the next screen is, uh, is it, what we do is listed a little bit. We try to keep the ba mother covered and warm and put warm blankets on the mother. Um, when we are in the OR um, in anticipation of the fact that we're going to bring the baby over. And the ORs um, are slightly colder than in the labor and delivery area, so we have the mother warmed with uh, blankets. We make sure um, we have our arms free, we don't, free of monitor probes. If we have a pulse oximeter or a blood pressure cuff that might come in the way, we try to make sure they're relocated and re position. If she is preferentially right-handed and she wants to touch the baby, we might actually take off a probe and let her hold the baby and touch the baby and then reposition it maybe on another finger or another hand or something. Even if, if there's a difference between, if we even if there's an interruption when the blood pressure cup goes off and the pulse ox doesn't read, we're yet okay with it just for a short while and then we probably reposition it. We make sure um, her clothing's loose enough and can be opened uh, when the mother, well, when the baby is born, and obviously jewelry that may compress or press on the baby's skin, or the mother's skin for that matter, is moved out of the way or taken off. We have additional blankets available to cover the baby with. Uh, so when, as soon as the baby is born from the baby's perspective, the, the baby's handed over, they quickly dry the baby, make sure they do a preliminary check, sometimes weigh the baby and sometimes measure the baby. And it's not always a regular phenomenon. Place an ID band, try and take a footprint if possible. Not necessarily always. Uh, place a cap and diaper for certain, dry and check and check the baby for certain and bring the baby promptly over to the mother. Um, and 
what we do, and that happens in the OR, is we have the mother warmed up, we move the clothing, get the father, who's usually sitting by the head, and to step away for a minute, place the baby, make sure the head, head, head and the face, the face of the baby is free of the mother's chest, and the baby can breathe. Um, we usually try and cry up the baby kind of crosswise. We haven't been able to place the baby vertically between the breast, but we've been able to place it crosswise. We also um, get the father to sit back down right where he was before. Um, and you, I'm going to ask you to imagine that he's sitting on the, on the little stool-like thing right by the, the mother's head on the on the mother's left side as she's la laying down for that surgery. She puts one of her arms around the baby just to feel that she's holding the baby, but we tell the father that she he needs to make sure he is responsible, that the baby is nice and secure, and anesthesiologist right by the head. And they're kind of watching the baby and the father and the mother, making sure the baby is being held well, and the nurse comes rather frequently to make sure the baby is breathing okay, the baby's head turned okay, the baby's secretions are being suctioned if necessary. And um, um, who can do it? Everybody can do it. Everybody that has a healthy baby, a healthy mother can do it, unless the mother needs extensive medical inter intervention as we go along, um, while well, the mothers can hold it. On the next screen, I just list the who can do it? I guess we skip the screen. No, I don't think so. Oh, well, I, I, that's fine. We, oh, we, there, maybe. Yeah. You want to do that one and then go back? Oh, it doesn't matter. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, I just described all this. Uh, we don't <laughs> want, uh, want to hurry the process. I just described the whole thing anyway. We try not to interrupt the mother um, and the baby with it together. When I say interruption, we talk to the mother if necessary, but we don't try to move the baby for unless it, it becomes necessary. And there's a certain time where, you know, there's a period where the mother and the baby looking at each other and they're very, very content and comfortable. And, and it, it's, it seems like to me a perfect picture and a pleasant picture that I guess um, a whole lot of obstetric <laughs> anesthesiologists really look forward to, quite honestly speaking. Um, so it, 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 it shows for such con you know, content with it. and it's quite truly a, 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 oh, a precious picture. Um, and on to the next screen, perhaps. Um, like I said, all mothers, all babies that are healthy, and I kind of bolded that l line to say all methods of delivery, whether it be general or under a regional block or a vaginal birth with epidural or with or without an epidural, they can all be um, subject to or allowed to have this experience. If, if they want to, there are some people that say, I, I don't want to hold the baby because I'm scared and we can always counsel them and say, you don't have to be scared. And this is, uh, it's, it's generally, well, we've had most, most, most always we've had people that, that will agree and hold the baby because uh, truly the mother is waiting to hold the baby anyway. So it's really not a, it's not a very hard sell. Um, and it's a good thing, so we should make sure. Um, we can do it. We do it here, and I know we didn't really have too much problem adapting this, so I don't think it's going to be that much of a problem. Just so we talk to all the parties involved, the anesthesiologist, the, pay, the, the mother herself, the parent of the mother or the husband of the uh, mother, so they can help with the support and so on. Um, obviously, um, Without you know, without overemphasizing the fact that if there's a medical necessity, we we need to meet that before we do a skin to skin. Um, what what about a spinal block? And I kind of said it. Um, I said talked about it just a few minutes ago. It's on the next screen. We try to re not this one though. I don't know why. Or anyway, um, there you on go. this is it. Yeah, we have a little bit of a. Anyway, uh, what we, we try to, we, in anesthesiology right now, we've been doing this for a little bit, so we almost expect that uh, we're going to have somebody um, that will do skin to skin. We basically assume we're going to do skin to skin, and we try and keep that, uh, the, you know, enough space, and we try to move the drapes over and out of the way, um, and we try to get her arms freed up 
from monitors. We never do anything with the arms. We uh, make sure the mother doesn't reach down or try to grab the belly if she's anxious, and we try to get her to hold the arm board or something um, on one side and the support person's hand on the other, just so we are, uh, if we are worried that she's going to drag, grab her belly or something, she feels a sensation. But by and far, they do very, very well indeed. And when the baby is ready, we tell them you're going to have to hold the baby, but you're not totally responsible. We're going to get the husband or the support person to be completely responsible to support the baby, lest she feel that, oh my god, I don't want to hold the baby because what if I drop it? Because that's a huge anxiety with new mothers, especially younger ones. So especially if they're not experienced, they worry about it all the time, I'm certain. So <laughs> we tell them, you won't hurt the baby, you just hold the baby, you support the baby, the husband's going to help you too, and we're here, you're right here by your head and to help you out. So we move, the, I already told you about how we move the monitoring probes. Um, we prepare the baby and the mother in, in, in no distinction. We just make more room, um, try to move, move the Move the drapes away, free the arms, move the monitors if necessary. We hardly ever restrain the arms unless they are under general anesthesia. So um, we let them take care of and hold the baby. If it's, if perhaps for chances um, the mother wishes to have the skin to skin, um, and the ba the mother's going to have a general anesthetic though that we know she's going to have or not, um, and it, or it becomes uh, an emergency or something, then the option is for the father to hold the baby. Um, again, communication takes on a huge um, uh, and important role, and if the ma father is prepared, he certainly will be willing and able to hold the baby as soon as the baby is born. Um, and the mother can take the baby over um, after the surgery is over. Once we are absolutely certain she is capable of holding the baby, um, it's not like she's going to hold the baby and be all by herself. There will be others around her, especially the support person is around her, and they can help hold the baby while she, uh, if she feels uncomfortable or insecure that she may not hold the baby. But otherwise, once she's responsive, she really wants to hold the baby, and she will certainly make a decision to hold the baby and we can help with that. It may not be right during the first hour, uh, depending on how long the surgery takes and how long the recovery takes from general anesthesia, but they usually hold the baby. I think that's on the next slide I just went and spoke to you about general anesthesia. Um, we can go over it if you want to. Not this one, the next one. There we go. Yeah, there you go. Um, but. Um, it can, it, all I'm saying is it's it's possible to do it, and then I'm, uh, what I have found is our mothers are more than happy and more than willing to do it. Our bigger bigger issue will be on the next screen. I think I talked a little bit about uh, obese patients. Um, what happens in obese patients is there's so little room um, sometimes, and what we have found that if we move the screen. Uh, or the curve of screen down some towards the patient's feet on both sides because we have them on IV poles, um, and then tip the the tables uh, head end up. Um, it makes a little bit of additional room, um, and um, the mother can hold the baby. The room is the, there is it, the the area the space is a little bit tight there, so we probably need to do take some extra. Um, efforts to make sure the mother is really holding the baby and the person that helps the baby will uh, will be more particular about how well the mother can hold the baby. Um, usually there are other, no other concerns just except that sometimes uh, the baby's face can, if the, baby, if the mother doesn't hold the baby right, if you're not watching the baby, can, the face can get buried in the mother's breast and we need to kind of look out for that and make sure things are okay. And we have we have had a fair, fair number of uh, such situations where we put the head end up and let the breast kind of uh, kind of gravitate down and have the baby up here, up by her neck or chest, and and it works just fine except that we need to be extra cautious about it. Um, and then we obviously um, some of our mothers actually want to hold the baby when we move the baby 
or from the OR table to the bed. Um, they are need to hug themselves anyway when we move them with a rolling board after a general anesthesia or a spinal anesthetic. And they are more than happy to hold the baby and we support the baby as they go over. And they hold the baby and, and um, we wheel them out and they are holding the baby proudly. Um, uh, and it, it's, quite a, it's quite a nice picture actually. Hold on. Um, We're getting some background noise. I mean, I'm going to mute everybody. Um, wait a minute, let's I'm, see. I'm probably getting, actually I could hear my own voice again. But anyway, um, well, a couple on is there, the screen I just make. Dr. Madam Anglin, uh -huh. uh, is there somebody that's maybe on a cell phone or something and they could mute themselves? Not in my office, no. No, I mean on one of our callers. Oh, you're right. Yeah. We can wait a second. And see if we can get... We've been doing good until... All right, let me mute everybody and then unmute our speaker. Let's see. Okay, Dr. Madam England, can we hear you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can. Okay. Can so I, mute, I muted... Can everybody ev hear me? I muted everybody for right now, except for oh, you. Oh, so. okay, okay. okay. Um, so uh, on the next slide, um, I sort of uh, write about how both hands of the mother can be freed up, uh, how much space can be made, and how uh, there's always somebody available. Uh, that's possibly a nurse um, checking on the baby. Um, there's plenty of space uh, if we can make it and, and move the drapes away. And I think that's the one that comes fairly close to the mother's face. There's plenty of space, so long as the mother realizes that she cannot reach down sort of below her elbow level, she should be fine. Um, that's all there is about that picture, quite honestly. And then um, um, on the next slide, I show a picture of one of our patients that has given us permission um, to put their picture up of how not only does the bonding occur between the mother and the baby, there's the other, it, it's a bonding time for the entire family. And it gives, um, I'm sure it en enhances their experience of uh, childbirth more than we can imagine. So I think we should do everything we can to help out and help with it there. And the next couple of pictures show um, our patients in our own um, institution that that did skin to skin during the early part of our adoption out here. And that's just to show that it can be done. There's plenty of room. This picture may not be under the drapes, but this may be a rational birth. I'm not completely sure what it is. No, this, yeah, this was one in the O, and baby's latched on, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's true. That is true. That is true. So, um, Matt, perhaps is all I have to say. Um, all I can say, it's not that hard, um, and it just takes a little bit of communication, uh, a little bit of um, forethought, and, um, and, and then it, it quite honestly it becomes quite an easy um, easy routine and that's what it has become for us and I've seen more and more uh, people adopting it and more and more um, acceptance. We in our own location we didn't really have much of a resistance to the whole process. We just presumed that it's, it's a good thing and uh, we discussed this and um, we had the baby, um, we, we prepared the mother and we prepared the anesthesiologist. We told the obstetrician that we're going to need a little bit of extra room. We might The drape might come up towards you and, and, and we went forward. We've done a, I think we've done a reasonably good job and we've basically, we have, we'll have, we have, currently I don't think we have any questions to ask when we said, oh, um, we're going to do skin to skin on this mother today. And it's like, okay, sure, we'll go on. It, it's, it seems like routine process for us. And I think that's that's basically it. So if you have any questions that I may be able to help answer, I'm more than happy to do them. I'm going to try um, unmuting, <clears throat> excuse me, unmuting everybody. And if we still get background noise um, that we can't hear, then I will mute you again. And if you, you can always type a question in the chat box too. So, uh, so I've just unmuted everybody. And We'll see how that sounds. Um, so do we have any um, any questions for uh, Dr. Madam Anglin? Oh, we are getting some uh, background. Um, but we'll see if everybody can hear okay. So any, um, any questions for Dr. Madam Anglin?
I know I can always think of some. Um, Dr. Ma'am Anglin, can you uh, share maybe? Oh, you know what? I am going to, hold on, I'm going to mute everybody because I can't hear either. And unmute. So anyone that yeah has questions can maybe um, type in the chat box. Um, uh, do you, you can everybody still hear, can you hear me, Dr. Madam Anglin? I can. I can. Okay. I don't okay. Great. The chat box, but I I can hear you. Because yeah, it should be over here on the um, right hand side of the screen. Can you see where it has the? No. It's, it's not showing up. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe box. it's only showing up on mine. Anyway, um, I don't see any questions yet, but um, can you can you share any, um, oh, click the orange arrow to expand. Yeah, I got it. I got okay. it now. Okay, thanks, Ingrid. Um, can you share any challenges y'all encountered um, uh, when you were first uh, starting this? Oh, no, I, I think the, the challenge was, oh, can we do this? I mean, it was a, more like a mental challenge than an actual physical challenge. It's like, oh, will the issue was, oh, are we going to be encroaching on the mother's airway? Is there any way we, uh, you know, we might not be able to get to her air, airway in a hurry if we need to, um, despite the fact that um, we had a, you know, we have reasonably um, complete confidence in the fact that we can always do it. We, our spinals are re very, very work really well, and this the instruction goes on. And it, I, from my perspective, and from what I kind of found was, it was more uh, an imagined obstruction to the airway that we all um, feel or seem when somebody says we're going to put a baby right up on that mother's chest. But once we understand and know that so there's always somebody that'll pick the baby off in a hurry if we need to. Uh, we can get the baby moved over, the father moved over. Um, it's it's really an issue of um, you know how an anesthesiologist space that's around the head and is occupied by non-anesthesiology people that really was an issue. It really was not a physical issue, and in in obese people maybe it becomes a little bit of an issue where there's very little room. We might have to move things around, and the mother may not be able to actually really reach out and reach up and hold the baby all that well and, and that, that was that was another concern but luckily for us we had not much of a challenge as long as the patient said we wanted they wanted to do um, skin to skin initially it felt new to us because it was the whole concept was kind of new but once we started working with it it seems like routine that we put our monitors further out than we usually do on the shoulder maybe and down by the chest and nothing um, on the arms, and when I say nothing on the arms, nothing um, in a way, it comes in the way, so if the mother wants to touch the baby or something, they don't have a pulse ox in the way. So um, it was more, uh, you know, thinking about it and kind of working through the process was what I think was a, a bigger challenge and not really um, a challenge as in, oh my, it's kind of going to be hard to surmount this problem. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's a question from Ingrid. To address the concerns or fears of parents, do you find that walking them through the process before helps them see it as normal? Uh, from the anesthesiology perspective, we've gotten to a situation where we tell them, if you have agreed to do skin, to, oh, first of all, most of the time they've already spoken about skin to skin, so they're looking forward to the skin to skin process. We usually tell them we'll make room, we'll warm your chest up, we'll have additional blankets, we'll be here, your husband's going to hold that baby and support the baby so you don't have to be scared about dropping the baby or something. The people are all, nursing is going to come and frequently look at the baby and make sure the baby is breathing well or not. So and that makes it, um, that makes it a lot more comforting for the patient to know a certain amount of what the plan is. Um, so you, uh, without a doubt, talking to the patient and patient acceptance um, is, is an extremely important aspect to the whole thing. But uh, trying to tell them what to expect next obviously um, makes it uh, makes me makes for 
a plan of action that the patient seems familiar with that makes makes it much easier. The the fear they have is like if something goes wrong with the baby, what am I going to do? Um, or what if I cannot hold the baby? Oh my God! If I what if I drop the baby? Um, is the baby breathing okay? Are the questions that mothers actually have had? And yeah, so yeah, it does make for a lot of comfort on the part of the um, patient or the mother. Okay. How do you deal with cold OR? Our again. doctors want the temperature very cold. Do you use a bear hugger? Um, our ORs are kept, we insist our ORs are kept about 65 degrees. Um, and I don't know whether I would call it a warm OR at 65 degrees or about. We want it at 67, but obviously our um, our surgeons get very warm and very hot under the lights and in, inside their gowns. Uh, but they all understand we need the OR swarm. Um, I, I, the thing we do is we have warm blankets ready. There are warm blankets right around the floor, uh, right outside the o, um, OR. We bring them and put them on the mother's chest and sometimes around the mother's head. Um, and then we we tend not to use the bear hugger. Um, with these in, in, in the labor and delivery unit unless the mother's very, very cold or sudden for some reason the ORs ended up being very cold, we bring the bear hugger and um, use a bear hugger. Um, we yet continue to deal with the fact that uh, we need to reset our OR temperatures on a regular basis. Um, it is definitely a challenge and I, but it, it's, it's a constant reiteration uh, to get the OR temperature high and, and constant talking to the obstetricians and keeping the mother as warm as we possibly can, uh, surely. And the, and we check the baby's temperature. And our nurses, I've noticed, check the baby's temperature rather regularly just to make sure that my baby's maintaining the temperature. The baby's maintaining the, its temperature. So okay, on that note, what's been a, a I guess, a compromise um, OR temperature that seems to work for everybody? Uh, we, we've we decided we're going to keep it at 67 degrees. Um, and we have, haven't had a, um, we haven't had a whole lot of um, issues with our uh, obstetricians talking about 67 as the temperature the OBORs need to be in. Mm -hmm. um, I guess they, if we ask our neonatologists, they would much rather have it higher. Um, I think they were talking about 60, um, 70 to 75 but we couldn't really get to that 70 number. So I think we've agreed on a 67 currently. <laughs> um, and I guess uh, what what we are hoping is um, we are remodeling our ORs, as you know, Becky, and we are going to, our ORs, uh, the temperatures for our ORs is low. Uh, this is obviously local. The temperatures of our ORs cannot be controlled locally. Um, oh, we are going yeah. to... Yeah, we need to get maintenance to mm -hmm. turn a dial mm -hmm. somewhere um, in the hospital, and it takes a little bit of time. We're hoping with the remodel, our ORs will have, we're not hoping, we know with the remodel, the ORs will have local temperature control, and if we see that the uh, the OR is very cold or the baby is cold, cooler than we think we want it to be, we can go up on the temperature, and that can be mm. you know, manipulated on an individual basis, which makes it a little bit more acceptable to the obstetrician mm -hmm. than having a blanket um, um, idea right. of having the ORs at 73 degrees or so, which just, you know, just the thought of it makes them cringe. <laughs> yeah. So do you, um, what about, because you mentioned having the dad there um, or support person, um, what happens, say, if um, mom doesn't have a support person um, and wants um, to do skin to skin? How do y'all manage that? Oh, if the mother's awake, it's never, never has, it never is an issue. And I, um, honestly, um, we don't really know what we we would do. Uh, if the mother has no support person, the mother has to go to sleep. Um, I w I'm kind of thinking it, it's sort of a um, rare situation. I mean, I don't know I've even seen um, any of such a situation. Uh, but I understand your question, and I'm kind of thinking, um, oh, um, like the, the situation would arise if, let us say, it's a, a, like a DOC patient. We take care of a fair number of DOC mothers 
who really don't have a support person other than the police officer. And usually the police officer or the correctional officer is not in the OR when we do this, when we do our civilian sections. But our general anesthetic rate here is, is very, very close to 1%, uh, if that. Okay. Um, so you so rarely our, have that, yeah. The situation is a very rare situation. Um, and I, you know, that's something I probably need to think a little bit about and see whether uh, we can have one of our, I mean, I'll also tell you a lot of our nurses do such a good uh, job of babysitting the, uh, and, you know, if there's a mother that has a young child as pregnant as having her next baby here, our nurses just take care of the baby uh, and uh, of the of the of the youngster, and the 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 mother has her baby. So our ba nurses play babysitter quite a frequent number of times, and I I dare say that one of them will have the baby in the mother's chest and hold the baby, um, hold the newborn, and sit by the mother if if it comes to that. Um, I'm sure we'll have volunteers for that in our own depending on how busy our floor is. But we'll, we'll probably do that if the mother, if the rare occasion arises that the mother wants to do skin to skin, the mother has to go to sleep. But it is such a rarity that I really haven't thought about it quite so much. But yeah. it does bring up an in, interesting situation. No, I was just curious. I didn't, and if it doesn't happen very often, then yeah, that's oh, not an issue. Yeah. But what about um, just in the normal, um, uh, course of events, um, are there, is there more than one nurse um, during the cesarean? Is there a, a, one nurse that's tending to the baby and one nurse for mom? Right, right. There's always one nurse for the mom. Um, and there's not all, there's definitely always one nurse for the baby, um, if not two sometimes. And, and then, um, so we, we um, luckily, that is not a shortage we've had to have, we've had to deal with. Uh, we, we have a circulator that's entirely devoted to whatever need the mother's needs are, and then a whole uh, baby advocate that takes care of the baby. Okay. So that, that is, that, that has not been an issue or a concern for us. We have enough people. And I guess it's a little bit different in different locations. And that will be a, a, a challenge to work through if there's okay. only one nurse for both the mother and the baby correct yeah that that's that was kind of my question yeah yeah how would you yeah. manage that so yeah Other, right. oh, go ahead I I, I, don't really, I mean there is some there are some tasks well again uh, is the mother asleep or awake is the question. If the mother is awake, I'm sure. Uh, if it's in our location, we had only one uh, We had only one person taking care of everything. If the mother is awake and holding the baby, the anesthesiologist by the head, they would be able to help out um, if the mother felt that they couldn't hold the baby. Um, because this, um, I'm, I'm sure we, I mean, it would be a rare situation with us. Uh, if it's a routine situation, I would think uh, if the mother has a general anesthetic, there's really nobody at all available, and I don't really know whether they can accomplish skin right. skin at all. Sure. So it's a little bit of a hard situation. Sure. No, we, we were actually um, doing a mock survey at a hospital, uh, and one of the OBs, um, as we were doing the practice interview about skin to skin, and he said, well, I'm all for skin to skin, but it's just really hard logistically, you know, when the mothers um, had a general anesthetic and they, they had actually put a baby skin to skin while the mother was unconscious. So uh, we said, well, you know, that's not actually uh, <laughs> the intent. So, and he was no. like, oh, good. No, <laughs> no we, I mean, mother needs to be awake. So. Yeah, there are many steps in this. I mean, there's, there's usually a support person and, and, and most of the time the mother is awake and at least in, in, in the current obstetric anesthetic practice, having the mother awake is a lot more, a way lot more common situation than having the mother asleep. And nobody really puts a mother to sleep unless there's a very distinct reason for having the mother to go to sleep. So the incidence is quite low. So, Other questions out there? Um, I haven't seen anybody put anything else in. Uh, I can try Let me unmute everybody and see how our sound is. 
still getting some background noise there. Any other questions from anybody? Maybe somebody that's not by a computer. Not hearing any. All right. Um, I'm going to go back and mute this again because it's too much uh, background noise. Um, unmute. Dr. Madam Angle. Well, I think um, I'm not seeing any other questions, so I think we will wrap this up. And just to let everybody know that um, this was um, has been recorded, and um, we will make this available on the website as well. So if you had others that weren't able to join or you had some of your positions that you wanted to share that with, so we will... Um, and we'll send, and we'll send um, Ingrid can send an email out when we when that's available for everybody. But um, thanks to Dr. Madam Anglin for taking the time to uh, share with Thank us you. today. We very much appreciate it, and um, thanks to everybody else for calling in. I hope that was um, helpful for y'all. So uh, we will let everybody go about their day and have a good day. And good day, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.